Hi, I'm Chris Shaffrey, the president of the AANS, and I want to invite you to Boston for our annual meeting, which is going to be held on April 25th through 29th, 2020. The theme of the meeting is the world of neurosurgery. It's going to be an exciting, informative, compelling meeting, and I strongly encourage you all to attend. Welcome to the Nurse Surgery Podcast. I'm Mike Wang, and I'm here with my co-host, Jake Nichols. We are here to discuss all things neurosurgical. Hi, this is J.P. Colson, a resident in neurosurgery at Rush University. Please note that this is not a CME event, and the opinions and statements made in this podcast do not reflect those of any institution or professional organization. Now, let's get started. So today we have as our guest, Joe Chang. Joe is the chair of neurosurgery in University of Cincinnati in Ohio, but more importantly, I always say that Joe has forgotten more about billing and coding than uh, I will ever learn. He's run the coding and the RUC and all those very important sides of what we do as neurosurgeons for, what, 25 years now? Is it 25 years? <laughs> Am I that old? <laughs> <laughs> and so this is really the lifeblood of what we do, right? So when we do surgery, we see patients, we do a consultation, we want to get paid, right? And so this is such an, an integral and complex process, and it's changing every day. We wanted to have you on the podcast to talk about it. Well, thanks, Mike, and I appreciate the opportunity to come talk. And, you know, I agree with you. You know, the, uh, the bottom line is we use phrases like no margin, no mission. And at the end of the day, while we are dedicated to our field and we want to do what's best for our patients, we still have to maintain a practice. We have employees, nurses, staff that continue to need to be paid. We need to be paid so that if we're not making, you know, appropriate uh, reimbursement or, or being uh, paid appropriately, you can't sustain a practice no matter how much you love your profession. I love to say that we're so altruistic that we literally be, you know, doing this uh, without any type of reimbursement and not have to have enough money to buy a house or a car and just, you know, live in a hospital like in the old days as residents. But unfortunately, that's not sustainable for our field in the future. And so I think this is why it's such an important topic. But the other thing is that it's also a topic that is challenging to talk about. You know, as physicians, we don't really like to talk about money. You know, we don't want to seem greedy. We don't want to seem like we um, do anything more than care for patients. And while I don't disagree that it is important to, to really, you know, to kind of continue to foster what's best for the patients as the primary reason why we do this, uh, again, like any other business, whether it's a charity like United Way, you can't help anybody if you're unable to keep your doors open, keep staff available, and really give people access um, to care. And that's why I think these aspects of, you know, being paid for your claims is pretty important. It really kind of puts the ball in the in the uh, in the court of really insurance companies and those that kind of control the revenue or the yeah. dollars. Well, we'll get to that. And I like what you're saying about no margin, no mission, because let's just emphasize to our listeners that we're not talking about greed. We're not talking about bad practices. We're not talking about anything other than part of what we do as human beings is, well, obviously you and I do lots of surgery for nothing, for free, right? It happens every week, every month, right, at the university. And that's just part of life. But but on the other hand, we got to keep the lights on, right? And that's, that's I, I like that you reinforce that. So... Obviously, as surgeons, most of what we're being paid to do is to do surgery, right? So walk me through, for, you know, some of our listeners are medical students or college students or maybe nurses. Like, so I see a patient or you see a patient in the clinic and you decide that the patient needs surgery. And it's, it's an accepted standard that this person would need a surgery, let's say, for a spinal fusion, right? What happens after you make that decision? That's a great question. And back to what you were saying before, which is, we do a lot of free care. It really actually determine. It's really dictated by what are you talking about. The steps needed. Uh, most of the time, when you're talking about things like reimbursement, it really varies on what the insurance company or the payer that the patient has. So, for example, if the patient's self-insured or that is uninsured, that is their self-pay, none of these things we're going to talk about actually makes a difference, right? right. It's you basically send them a bill, they pay for it or they don't pay for it. 
it really doesn't require any of these steps. And that's what you typically see when you're taking care of someone that comes in. Like, for example, we'll have someone maybe who's homeless that uh, gets hit by a car and comes into the trauma room on a Saturday night. You take care of the patient. You don't worry about any of these things right. because it's pretty irrelevant overall. It also is pretty irrelevant with certain payers. For example, Medicare doesn't really require pre-authorization or... Uh, yet. Yet. <laughs> well, I should take that back. Uh, when we talk about Medicare, there's different variations of Medicare. So that if you're part of this, the, the typical Medicare, uh, that is the pure Medicare plans, you typically don't need any of that. But that's if you're straight of, Medicare. You're that's straight, straight Medicare. Medicare. Okay. But if you're part of like a Medicare HMO or other types of Medicare offerings of that sense that is run through a third party, then they may have these pre-certification processes that you're referring to, and then you have a bunch of hoops that you have to jump through. But I even see that now. People come to say, oh, I've got great insurance. I have Medicare and a supplemental. And so the Medicare part's fine, but then the, you know, let's just pick one at random, Blue Cross Blue Shield or AARP supplemental says, well, we're not going to authorize our part unless. It's like the sum of the parts is the sum of the parts, not the combination, right? So one component of insurance holds you up, right? That's right. So basically... The, the company that is needing to pay the remainder of the balance, uh, either the 20% copay or supplemental or whatever aspect that you're talking about, they actually have their own set of rules. And you have to remember, that's their business model. So the business models of insurance companies are very different than what we are looking at. So insurance companies usually get their um, revenue from premiums, uh, either premiums or self-insured institutions. So if you work for a large university or a large corporation, they actually will just have the insurance company almost like a managing system and uh, not really insuring them per se, as it, the institution will self-insure and just use a company like Aetna or, or Cigna to help to kind of administer their insurance policies. But at the end of the day, there's really only two main components of how insurance companies get revenue, and that's going to be premiums, including from self-insured um, uh, programs, and then something else called float, which is the revenue generated by the investments, short-term investments, of these premiums into their company, um, you know, that they were investments to other companies that they get the uh, short-term interest rates on. It's called float uh, overall. And that's one of the challenges. Uh, a few decades ago, a group of physicians, I believe it was the pediatric uh, physicians, actually had sued based on this whole idea that there were delays in payments in order to maximize the float. Out of the pool of money that then the insurance company works with, there is a cap of roughly 15% called the SGNA expense, and that's your general selling, general you know expenses with that. And then the 85%, what people usually refer to, is usually called a health benefit ratio or medical loss ratio. That oh, is it's a, funny how it's, uh, they sound like opposites with the same yeah. thing, right? Right, it is. Well, it used to be called the medical loss ratio, and they changed the name to health benefit ratio because of... I like to call it medical win ratio. That's <laughs> <laughs> a better term overall. So, But that's really what they're trying to control because out of the spending of that medical loss ratio, or the health benefit ratio comes the third part of what the insurance companies need to cover, which is dividends, which is the profit that's given to the shareholders of a for-profit company. And this is something that you can actually see within something called 10K reports, which are filed annually with the SEC for really companies with stocks, publicly traded, uh, et cetera. So what you kind of realize with in their model, they're actually, their revenue stream banks on you not using the benefits. I got to do a fellowship with you, Joe. You taught me so much already. And I, I'm thinking back to when my accountant's telling me about my taxes and saying, and I'm so stupid about this stuff. He's like, you know, no, no, don't pay the taxes this year, but you might pay it next year. I'm like, who cares? I'm paying the taxes. They're like, no, no, you don't understand. You've got to delay the paying of the tax now for later because all then they'll give you a long list of why, but you've already explained it, which is that money sitting in Wall Street or somewhere making more money for them, right? When they delay you 30 days. That's true. Their float does go mm -hmm. up whenever a payment is delayed because they are still holding on to that dollars. But I think that what you're saying is that their model for how they generate revenue is different. Plus, their products are different. So remember, insurance plan is not an insurance plan. So you may have a company or you have a patient 
that only has major medical or the quote-unquote Cadillac of coverage plans, or they may have a PPO or other types of more limited plans that they can afford, like a basic plan, uh, for example. That's one of the reasons why it's important when you're talking about pre-authorization is that you actually need to start off with is what is covered for this patient. So if the patient, for example, uh, there are some insurance plans that don't have uh, vertebral augmentation uh, as mm -hmm. part of it. For example, uh, in the past, Champus, which was a military-type insurance, didn't actually cover vertebral augmentation. And that was based on the Colmas Cal uh, New England Journal paper? Actually, it was even before that. that the bookbinder? That's just based... Really? That's just based... Before that? So it, just ba it, it was basically based on what the insurance plan will cover. So if the insurance plan, for example, doesn't cover pregnancy and deliveries, you know, for your family, and that's what you bought. It doesn't matter how much you try to justify proper prenatal care and proper OB care, you just never bought that insurance plan. Is this in a book somewhere, or like, can you, how do you find out if you're covered for this, surgery? This is actually part of the insurance policy and why your pre-certification, the staff that does the pre-certification has to call, and the first thing you have to do is verify, does this patient have benefits? For, um, for this procedure or for this service in an elective fashion. Now, this is not unique to spinal or neurosurgery, right? This is across the board for all That's right. medicine? The, what, we're, what we're talking about is just this is the standard process of how do you even start the process of whether or not the patient has coverage because if you take the patient for a procedure that they are not covered for, for example, if the insurance policy has a standing policy against the use of, say, bone morphogenic protein. It doesn't matter if you use it during your surgery, they're just not going to cover it. Or if they don't cover sacroiliac joint fusion, for example, it doesn't matter how you justify it, what evidence you pull, they just don't have that as a covered. Uh, and by the way, just for our listeners, we're not advocating any of these procedures per se as a, no. as a principle, we're just talking in generalities. Correct. And these are just examples of things that insurance companies had specifically carved out of what they didn't cover. Right. So this is very interesting to me because, uh, like, I have very few absolutes in my life. The whole world's great to me. But here's an absolute I'll throw out to you. Any patient that's ever talked about their insurance tells me, oh, don't worry, Dr. Wang, I have great insurance. And never have they ever, certainly before they needed help, said, no, I have horrible insurance. Just get ready, right? And they, the insurance companies are really good. They, they, their messaging is strong that... Somehow everybody thinks they have good insurance, and then when things are denied, they're like, oh, well, how did that happen, right? But you're telling me that this is a little bit different than that, and maybe you could help me out because, like, how did we get to this situation where, like, where all this is happening? It's so complicated. Yeah, I think part of it is that it is complicated, and how we got here was that the majority of things that we're talking about aren't typically taught to either patients or their physicians. So we are just kind of naive walking into these situations. And so even Medicare has things called national, national coverage determinations that determine what they will cover and what they won't cover. And if you have a national coverage determination against the procedure you're trying to perform, it doesn't really matter how you argue it. There's also certain procedures that even Medicare has called CEDs, which is coverage with evidence determination, which is a specific procedure that requires you to have a registry, uh, data collection, net tools, et cetera, that allows them then to reimburse you for that procedure. And if you don't have it, guess what? It's not considered wow. a covered entity. So let's break it down for the, for the private practice surgeon who's managing an office. It's just simpler that way, right? So you're working in an office and you want to do surgery on a patient. And, and um, the, the title of this is denial of claims because that's, like that's a trigger, right? Denial of claims, oh no. So the, the surgeon gets this denial of claims, let's say before surgery, right? That's usually better than after surgery. <laughs> and and you, they have to set up these phone calls with people. Like what, like what do you recommend? I know you can't give all the secrets, but like it's very common, right? That you're told this procedure or this stay or whatever is not covered. What's the surgeon to do? Like what's the general strategy here? Mm, the general strategy is actually start with your office staff and make sure that there are people that actually are diligent uh, and people that are going to pay attention to the um, steps in getting a claim uh, or a procedure pre-certified. The reason I say that is it's, it's, it's kind of funny how in most of our practices, our front desk, which is the face to our patients, our call center, the ones that actually 
help coordinate our care and availability of our care and our pre-certification department, whether it's for MRI, CTs, or surgeries, we tend to make them our lowest paid employees and people that we actually don't really care about their level of education or experience. It's just whoever's willing to take those jobs and we treat them like such. So because of that, would you really be surprised that sometimes they overlook details in their work that you require somebody who almost needs a PhD to understand the lingo, the CPT code. And you teach those courses. I know you've been teaching for 20 years, right? For the WNS and NAS and... We have. And well, if you remember when you invited me down to Miami years ago as a visiting professor and I was talking to your coders, you had an issue in Miami that I remember, I still use as an example, where you were getting denied on claims for taking care of patients with lumbar stenosis. You were doing um, some type of posterior approach and interspinous or other types of uh, right. procedures. And your, and your coders were telling me how you're, you just were not being paid for lumbar stenosis, that something changed for the treatment of lumbar stenosis. And if you remember, they went through this whole process looking at everything from your, your clinic dictations, using excuses like, well, it must be the residence documentation. Right, right. I remember problems. that, yeah. So basically, but if you remember how it ended up, it ended up that that was back when we used ICD-9, and there was two ICD-9 codes, 724.02, lumbar stenosis, 724.03, lumbar stenosis with neurogenic claudication. Your insurance plans in Miami at that time only covered treatment, surgical treatment of lumbar stenosis if neurogenic claudication was present. So by transposing 7.24.02 uh, instead of writing down 724.03, you had a whole list of denials. The problem is that no one actually was able to think through that yeah. granularly, and that was it. That was, that was why you were getting the denials for lumbar stenosis surgery, is because the patients based on ICD coding had no claudication from what was being documented, but your staff wasn't quite ready to really dig through that because they really didn't understand ICD coding. Yeah, and they're too busy, but I, we gotta bring it down again because I'm sure you've unearthed yeah. all kinds of problems we got. So, but the way you would say it, it, like if I were a patient listening to this podcast, I would say to them, oh my God, I thought that the doctors decided what happens and the way you're, you're telling me this and it's kind of what we feel, you know, we just did a, a podcast on burnout with Phil Stieg. Like, it's like, it seems like the insurance company holds all the cards. Well, they hold all the cards if you want to get paid. <laughs> you know, if you want someone to pay the bills, then they absolutely do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, that's just part of a third-party payer system that we have in the United States, and we've relegated that. Um, yeah, I don't want to get political and start into the Medicare for All because we're going into election year, <laughs> but we could have a whole – I mean, I know you – Anyways, we could talk about all that, but what what is uh, so organized neurosurgery, right? So you represented NAS, spine section, WNS, and CNS, and any any other societies? Those those four big ones, right? That have the seats in the AMA House of Delegates. What is organized neurosurgery, in particular the WNS? Like, what are they doing about it? Because everybody's like, "What are you doing to help us?" Right? So tell us what you guys are doing, because I know you. It's a volunteer organization. Do it for. As, I mean, you're not paid to do this, right? No, we're not paid to do it, and we do it because it is a labor of love. And at the end of the day, the idea is to maintain appropriate reimbursement to, uh, to ensure patients' access to beneficial care. That's why things like evidence-based processes, looking at literature guidelines to help drive a lot of our decisions are pretty important. And we do the work really because it's uh, one of the things we just are driven to do, which is kind of like the right thing. So, for example, one of the things we're working on is how to avoid narrow networks and the idea of balanced billing. You know, the idea of surprise medical bills is a very important topic that it, quote, it potentially, you know, affects how our patients are treated. Medical bank or bankruptcies, personal bankruptcies in the United States is still a major issue, and medical bills is still one of the top three right. reasons for that. And we always talk about how there's a difference between curing versus healing. Curing a patient's disease process only to drive them to social ruin through bankruptcy, you still didn't do anything to heal them as a person. So it's important to kind of look at this in that big picture. Now, what I said before is that we talk about things that are appropriate. And as you kind of alluded to, part of the challenges in medicine that we face is that there are going to be some cases where you have patients that 
have no resources to, to reimburse you, like the patient that falls and hits their head on a Saturday night that, um, that you take care of without even thinking about it. And so because of that, sometimes we have to balance that by making sure that we're paid appropriately across the other means so that we can continue to keep uh, you know, taking care of patients the way we think is the best way we possibly can. Thank mm -hmm. you.